<laughs> yeah, there's no such a thing as a clean take in this video, apparently. Bloop boop boop. Bloop doop doop. Bloop doop da ba Hi, I'm Ramin. I like animals, and we are going to be talking about television shows from and or ending in and or adjacent to 1989. I'm Molly, and I like the miscues. I'm Erica. And I'm Michael. What we've normally done in the past is talk about all of media in 1989, and that ended up usually being like two separate videos that were each 45 minutes long. So we're, we're going to break it up into just sections this time and we'll just talk about TV this time. So hopefully it's a little bit shorter. Yeah. I said, hopefully it's gonna be a little bit shorter when we did our albums of 1989 and it was not short. So we'll see. Um, we're gonna go through new shows in the order that they premiered. I was not allowed to watch late night TV in 1989. I wasn't either, but I remember Bill Clinton was on, which probably would have been later than 1989, but it was like a big deal because he played the saxophone. I know, and this would go, that was where who, 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 who yeah. came from. Mm -hmm. That was the art from the old, and they're like, that's just like everywhere now. Well, maybe not now, maybe it has sort of gone out of fashion, but it was for a while. Uh, all I really remember about the Arsenio Hall show is what I've seen on Behind the Music on VH1, which is that he discovered a super pooper bunch of music acts. Like, he discovered Mariah Carey, I guess? He discovered MC Hammer? And I'm saying discovered, like, but, like, them being on his show helped them launch into further fame. A lot yeah. of comedians got their start on his show, too. He was at an archaeological dig and he heard some whistle tones and there he discovered Mariah Carey. He just dug her up. He cracked open her tomb and then she was free. <laughs> chip, 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 and Dale. I was like about to sort of say like my memories of watching that show and then I suddenly realized that I definitely have it like smushed together and like just mixed up with DuckTales and like that was not the same show. I do think it's fun how the Rescue Rangers sort of redefined Chip and Dale, because Chip and Dale have been around since right. like the 40s or 50s. For as long as Mickey. your friend. They used to be strippers. Weren't they more or less the same character? They were just like two mischievous little chipmunks. Yeah, and they, they were basically, yeah, and, and they would harass Donald Duck. Yeah, and they, they didn't really have the full fleshed out personalities until Rescue Rangers, I believe. Yeah, one of them, there were some of the old cartoons where the, one was like, it was a little bit of a pinky in the brain th kind of thing going on, where one was a little bit smarter and the other one kind of went along with the road. And one of them had a reddish nose, mm -hmm. but I can't remember which one. Yes, I remember that when I was a kid and I went to Disney World, that was the rule for how you could tell them apart when you mm -hmm. like met the, met the characters was that one had a red nose. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers was fun. I don't, I, re I remember really liking it, but I don't remember anything about it. One of them was wearing basically an Indiana Jones outfit and one of them was wearing a Hawaiian shirt. That's basically all I remember. Yeah, this was another one that I was sort of thwarted by, by the fact that we never had the Disney Channel. It was only, I could catch it on the free preview weekends and it wasn't frequent enough. I remember watching that show, but I couldn't tell you like anything. I think it was just one of those things where like, this is the only thing that's on. I wouldn't say that, oh, I loved that show, but I usually watched it when it came on if I hadn't seen it before. Cause I, f I did find it fascinating. And you know, it's hosted by William Shatner. So there's gonna be a certain amount of cheese and reliability and sort of formulaic pattern that you can follow. But I still have images in my head of some of the stories I saw. I don't know a damn thing about that show, but I do love Reno 911, the spinoff of it that was created <laughs> decades later. <laughs> This is one of those shows, much like Goosebumps, that when I was a kid, I like couldn't even watch for five minutes without being utterly scared and poop, like pooping your pants scared and turn it off. And now I'd look back and I like watch it again and I'm like, what the hell? Like this <laughs> I to be afraid of the like zombie skeleton guy. <laughs> yes, he was so scary. That the weird keeper, I think. I don't remember anything from the show itself. All I remember is the scary puppet that introduced the like story segments. And he was in a lot of commercials, so we saw him pretty regularly. I, I don't think I ever actually saw an episode of this show, but I know exactly who that is. Down, 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 down. 
<laughs> the show about nothing. You know, it's made a comeback because it's on Netflix now. So, like, all the Gen Zers who, like, got into Friends, like, two years ago are now into Seinfeld, which I think is hilarious. But you know what? Like, I think a lot of Seinfeld holds up. I think it holds up better than Friends, which seems to have had such a perennial popularity and that I think is not earned. There were so many gags in that show that were so funny. I think of, like you know, the Festivus gag or like the thing about the, she stole the marbled rye. <laughs> and the, like, uh, you know, or the soup, the soup Nazi, no soup for you. Like if you didn't grow up watching Seinfeld and somebody said no soup for you, you'd be like, yeah, no soup for you. Like, like they would say it without even realizing where it came from. Yeah. I was today years old when I found out that No Soup For You is from Seinfeld. But I think some of the like smaller gags of like the way Kramer enters, that's a funny little physical gag. And well, and also all of his like schemes and stuff. Yeah. Were so yeah. funny. That show is very much all about the cast who was not Jerry. Jerry was the least interesting person on that show. Well, he was the straight man, which is funny that he was the straight man because He's literally like the stand-up comic in yeah. the show. But like Jason Alexander is such a theater, like a lovable theater nerd. And Julie Louis-Dreyfus is just actually fantastic in everything she does. <laughs> I can watch Seinfeld and enjoy it just because the part of me that is a theater kid loves the craft of it. And yeah. like, like can really admire the effort that these actors are putting into making this sometimes middling material really work part of what made it appealing was just how absurdist it was and also how kind of like nihilist it was. It was really um, like very Gen X. But that's kind of, to me, the part that I like about it is the ability to make like any line or moment work. That's what I mean when I say craft. Like the, the comedy of that show is not necessarily like I Love Lucy, where the situation is also humorous, like the, the chocolate conveyor belt, right? The situation is not the comedy part. The, situ the, the execution is the comedy and like the way that they, that they inflect the line and, and gesture and stuff, that's what's cool to me. Yeah, it wouldn't have worked with any other cast and it wouldn't have worked if the cast didn't have the same chemistry that they had. Yeah. yeah. It's a little wild and a little strange. Let me just impress upon you. The importance of this show in my childhood, I truly, truly think this was my favorite childhood show. And I cannot even tell you why, except for the great character development and the fun stories and the fact that it came on in 1989 and was on in syndication, like literally forever. And it also the hot Native American cowboy. Yes, Danny was cute. Ted had his moments. And, you know, the, the, the woman, I forget her name now, the woman who played Melody was like actually a good actress. And she went on and did a lot of, the, of other things. And I am telling you, look, the set that they used in Tucson, Arizona is still there. It's an abandoned hole with the buildings falling apart. There's a lot but of I'm that in going... Tucson, Arizona. That's true. If I had a nickel. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going out there one day. It's on my bucket list. I loved that show, too. I actually didn't remember this show until I just Googled the picture and saw the hot Native American cowboy. And now I remember it. <laughs> so this is a show that definitely was big in my childhood. But looking back on it now, I ha it, it was pretty problematic. I don't mean like in the way that our, our current social justice warrior oriented minds might think, although that's true too, but more like the way it normalizes high school bullying and it normalizes like who should be cool and who shouldn't be cool. They like, were, with were they friends with Screech though? Were they really friends with Screech? Well, that was friends with Screech. No. Were they friends with Screech? Yeah. Or did they hang out with Screech so they could feel better about themselves and call themselves oh. friends with Screech? Ooh, truth telling! I mean, it's true that, like, Screech was not treated the way that anyone else on that show was treated. That's true. He was and that's what I'm guy. saying. And it was so normalized that even today we say things like, oh, we were friends. They were friends with Screech. They weren't friends with Screech. <laughs> and you think I'm kidding, but I'm kind of not. Like, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm getting dramatic. In fairness, 
Screech was sexually harassing Lisa Turtle. I mean, yeah, that's true too. Yes, and. And again, that's not the only thing that was problematic with this show. Like, we could sit here and talk about the fact that where were the Black people, right? Lisa Turtle. (laughs) Okay, cool. So there was one. But that's what I'm saying is it's this like weird gray area where like, because there is a nerd, because there is a black person, oh, we're cool with them, even though like they're very clearly treated differently. I thought that Saved by the Bell kind of did maybe a touch better than some other shows of its time. And that oh, was no. because its audience was younger. Its audience was people like us and they wanted I... us to see that. Saved by the Bell did try a lot of things and they didn't always completely nail the landing. The caffeine pills thing, <laughs> it's it's so, so quotable. Like the most quotable thing on TV from the late 80s and, and early 90s. That was literally one of the first times it was ever talked about on television. They were trying to open up that conversation and it was trying to show that she can reach out to her friends and her friends are going to look out for her. So there was like, yeah, there are things that were mishandled, but there were also things that were like, this was the first time it was done and it was necessary. It was a necessary first step, even if they tripped a little, you know what I mean? The first time it was done that we know of, and that was geared toward people our age. A lot of the times you hear today in these sorts of, I don't like to use this term in this sort of context, but woke conversations that you hear people say, well, what you intended doesn't matter. It's your words that mattered. And I think that's sometimes a little misguided. I think that intent should be taken into account because if you don't consider someone's intent first, you really run the risk of closing off an opportunity for dialogue. Erica, you're making a good point that um, the intent behind these episodes was pure. I think that the execution was lacking, but I think how we respond to that intent is really critical. I think we can yes and the situation, you know? Yes, your intent is pure and it kind of fucked this part up right here. But if we don't start from that well-intentioned place, then we just start to really shut down dialogue and it becomes this thing that I really hate about social media right now where it's this competition of performing wokeness. Eureka, Eureka's castle. Uh, six-year-old me was obsessed. You know, it's so interesting because, like, I feel like I remember when Eureka's Castle was, like, introduced as a new show, and I don't remember ever being the age to be the target audience for Eureka's Castle, and yet, in 1989, I was four years old, which means I was extremely the target audience for Eureka's Castle, so maybe I just, like, always was extra mature. (laughs) Eureka's Castle was very much an off-brand version of a lot of shows that did it better. Like, it was no Gullah Gullah Island. Eureka was good, not great. The puppet work on Eureka's Castle was really great. All I remember was a dragon. Wasn't there a dragon? There was a dragon. His name was was Castle. His name was Magellan. Yes. I'm not sure why I just specified that there's a castle, but it's literally the title. (laughs) I thought Eureka's Castle was wonderful because in 1989, I turned seven years old. So I was definitely its target demographic. I just thought it was very colorful and imaginative. It had, again, really great characters like the guy Batley, who was like the resident Transylvanian vampire type who was just a big bumbling fool was like adorable. Magellan was wonderful. I really liked all those characters and that's that's sort of been my common theme for all my favorite childhood shows. It's just really good character work. I remember this! I remember this being extremely disappointing. And super weird! Yeah, I knew it existed. But I ne- I don't think I ever saw any of it. I've seen more clips making fun of it than I have any actual airing of it. I'm glad I'm not the only one who missed it because I really thought it was like something that as a Super Mario Brothers super fan that I should have been watching and I really wasn't. It's like if you took like a white mom's idea of the Super Mario Brothers and turned it into a TV show that was syndicated. It was a five days a week show but every Friday's show was a Zelda-themed show. Yeah. I know a little bit more about the Zelda episodes than I do the Mario episodes, because, like, there's some weird things, like Link has a catchphrase of, will excuse me, princess, which is like... like Martin? <laughs> it, it makes absolutely no sense for the character. <laughs> Because really, if it were like true to character, Link would say, ha! Ha! 
I wanted to be on it really badly. <laughs> I wanted to be on it too. And like, we all had our ideas of like how we would handle all the different mm-hmm. obstacles, right? Yeah. I mostly only remember the gladiators themselves and the obstacles. Am I mixing? Okay, so there were actually, there were gladiators and then there were like normal people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what it is. I feel like that show has a legacy that has continued with shows like American Ninja Warrior. Which and is superior. Like, Oh, totally, totally. But like American Gladiators had that 1989 glam to it, you know? <laughs> Television is weird, basically. It's, you know, it's sort of the basis form of entertainment, like stupid human trips, tricks, yeah. kind of. <laughs> oh, but there's something even more specifically that's really base humor coming up in a little bit. I watch this show a lot because when I was a kid, I loved Beetlejuice. Well, I remember watching Beetlejuice and being kind of afraid of it Mm -hmm. but the beetlejuice tv show that i could get down with because it was animated right yeah it was animated and then later i could actually watch the beetlejuice movie without it being scary in the movie beetlejuice is the villain and he tries to like marry lydia against her will and all this stuff and it's like really weird and sketchy but in the show he and lydia are like partners who go on like hiking together yeah i remember remember. it was weirdly lewd it was a little kind of underground and a little dark at times like i've seen that the weird claymation raisins but i didn't know they had their own show until i was looking stuff up for this yeah they sang i heard it through the grapevine i remember that but i don't remember there being a show connected to that the show was slightly disturbing that's all i remember david hasselhoff Pamela Anderson, some other guys. <laughs> Everybody else. <laughs> there was red swimsuits. There was slow motion running. Okay. That's the show. <laughs> That's the show. But like, I remember it being like watching it on occasion and like it being like a very serious opera. But like also Pamela Anderson, you know, she was like a huge deal back then, right? I think Pamela Anderson sadly gets a bad rap. She's very forthright about what she does. And in interviews, she's always very well spoken. And I feel like it's a little sad that her image gets boiled down to sex appeal. Just because she posed in Playboy does not mean that the world has ownership of her body. And a lot of people thought of her that way. What consent is about, right? Like the ability to withdraw consent. Oh, did I do that? So here's the thing. So Family Matters premiered in September. Urkel does not show up on the show until December. That's correct. And then the show became a hit at that point. (laughs) Basically, yeah. (laughs) Oh, but I loved Family Matters. I thought it was really, really funny. Yeah, Family Matters is one of those shows that like the Cosby show was very palatable to white audiences and probably did a lot of good for race relationships, even if not everybody represented felt like they were good representations. (laughs) Um, I did see a tweet about like how the dad in Family Matters was a cop and the show was basically copaganda. Yeah, it's a difficult tightrope to walk with some stuff like this. We can still say that all of the people involved in this were really good, even if the subject matter wasn't necessarily 100% great. (laughs) My usual thing is, again, the characters. I thought that all the characters in this were really unique. They were unique and special in the context of the show, but they were also unique sort of in the world of television at the time. Like Carl, who was the main character, the dad was like very special, working hard and like, very, very funny. And it came across very naturally because that actor is good. But like bringing Urkel in and the popularity that he created for the show was really well handled. His character was fun. All the kids were fun, even though one of them sort of just disappeared and we just stopped talking about her because I think she left the show or something, the youngest. Again, it was just really funny. There were just a lot of really good creative jokes in it. I think there are things in Family Matters and Fresh Prince. The idea of the like the funny black nerd character in Urkel in Carlton. Mm-hmm. They're fairly new ideas in the popular culture. 
And it helps a lot of people who don't know a lot of Black people to realize that, like, oh... There's different ways to be a Black person. Yeah, I think that these shows, like, are important because I think you need both. I think you need representation, rep, representation, <laughs> representation of um, both the thing that people think they already know to show them that it's more than they know and the thing they don't know. Characters like Steve Urkel, which when we look back now are a total caricature, but at the time, like like some people were saying, was so important because until then all you had were these these caricatures of black people created in like hip hop music that was designed to be sold to white people. These caricatures created by white people of like the thug black guy, for example, or like the, um, you know what I'm saying? I don't need to continue with detail. I think it's really important to point out though, that when we're talking about representation in this context, we're talking about representation to a mainstream white, straight, middle-class audience. So if you're already in a community of Black people, it's represented all around you, right? This diversity, or maybe it isn't. I don't not, know, not, not I, on I have not, a mainstream white middle-class yeah. uh, society myself. But, but not, not necessarily on television and movies. That is still very new. Right, so like, so, but I think to that end, if you are in one of those communities, the kind of representation that maybe you're looking for in media is maybe even more diverse than what we're talking about with regards to Urkel <laughs> and Carlton. It's like, I wanna see even more variations in the spectrum. Whereas to a mainstream audience, like, hey, you can be black and play the accordion? Whoa. <laughs> I think I think these were steps going that direction. That's why I think they were important. Again, like you, Molly, as as white sort of lower middle class, maybe it's not our it's not our our fight. It's special for us to talk about it and to be able to talk about it because we grew up with all of these shows. Like it's an yeah. important conversation to have. Yeah, or even that, it is our fight because we have to fight for people that have less power. Yeah, yeah. so that's 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 the point that I was going to make. Like, like sort of to what both of you just said, we are not the experts in this mm -hmm. as three white people and one very white passing person. <laughs> to solve these issues, white people need to be doing the work but following the lead of the people that are affected by these issues. America, this is you. Beating up on each other and taking videos of it while it's happening. <laughs> and taking footballs to the nuts. America's Funniest Home Videos is occasionally, like, legitimately really funny. But it's sort of like, is it jackass humor? Or is it, like, funny situa situational things that you just happen to catch? Like, to me, it's never really that funny if somebody's trying to do a cool bicycle trick and, like, falls and hits their nuts. Like, that's not funny <laughs> to me. <laughs> It's not to say that everything on the show was terrible, because there's also like, look at this stupid thing my dog did. And like, yeah, you know, that like that can be legitimately really funny. My barometer was always the way my mom reacted to that show. Because my parents watched this show religiously. And my mom, if it was like a slapstick thing, would be like, oh, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> and if it was like not someone getting hurt, she would actually laugh. And that is kind of my own moral compass. It's true though, some of those things were not funny. Like yeah. like a little child falling off the swing and then maybe having a concussion. Yeah. I don't know, you know? And some of them were like very obviously staged and just yes. mean and yeah. Ugh. Though this did exist for a year already oh, uh, as part of the trade as part of the Tracy Ullman show. In 1989, The Simpsons became their own show. When it was weekly, it was on every week. Like, I believe it was Tuesday night at eight. We were there. We were ready to watch The Simpsons as a whole family. Halloween could not miss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Treehouse of Horror. Always, always watch The Simpsons on Halloween with our like, candy that we had just gotten back and we're like sorting through and the Simpsons likes our discussion about Seinfeld earlier so many things in popular culture 
that I think people don't realize are from The Simpsons are from The Simpsons. I, my parent, that's so funny because my parents were the polar opposite. They were like, this is inappropriate. And like constantly like, ew, my mom, that's so gross. Why do you like that? The Simpsons. But I loved The Simpsons. <laughs> it was seen as this like controversial, like gross, like inappropriate thing because like, I don't remember it being gross. I mean, it was maybe base humor, but it wasn't like... There were worse things on television. Yeah. Mainstream television. Yeah, like, I, I think some of the worst stuff that was on the show was, like, a Homer choking Bart, yeah. <laughs> which happens in, like, almost every episode, especially in the early seasons. And it's like, yeah, like, we don't want an actual father to be doing that to, the actu- to their actual son, but... <laughs> but I feel like that's not what people were mad about. I feel like they were mad about like Bart being like a whippersnapper and like swearing. And he didn't really, no. right? Like he was a brat. He was Dennis the Menace, basically. Yeah. They were just different. They were anti the clean cut family image. And it was also animated, which was was not still very atypical to see that on, on prime time. So people were just like, what the heck is going on? And why are these kids talking back to the adults? Like it was, it was an old fashioned thing to think that the Simpsons was gross. And I think that was part of the controversy was that because it was an animated show, people associated animated shows with shows for children. Yes. And so it was not a show for children. Although in 1989 and 1990 and 1991, I was four, five and six years old and I was 100% 100% watching The Simpsons with my family. <laughs> yeah. But like, there was never any indication of like, Molly, this is not appropriate for you. Even though I knew that I had friends that weren't allowed to watch it. The show is still on, still making new material. It's still on. It hasn't been funny in years. Th- it's occasionally. I know because I don't watch it. <laughs> right. It's occasionally a little bit funny. I won't say it's bad. I will say that I don't think it's funny anymore. <laughs> the movie but I mean, was it is good. a cultural icon, you know. Yeah. Like, we can't deny that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Remichael Trivia Show. America's Funniest Home Videos. That was number five. Mm-hmm. What? Number five? It's I guess like, I it underestimate a... America's love for people taking balls to the balls. <laughs> And it was like that the whole time it was on. It was always like really highly rated. Uh, I'm going to go with the Cosby show for 500, Alex. <laughs> that was once again, number one. And I'm going to go with Designing Women. Designing Women is not on the list. Molly has her first error. Ooh, what a blunder. 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes was number seven. So I feel that America is both horny and sexist. So I'm going to say Baywatch. Baywatch was not. Well, look at you, America, proving me wrong. You know what? I forgot my favorite answer, which is the Cosby Show spinoff, A Different World. That was number four. How did I overlook that? Which gets Molly seven points. Always my go-to answer if I don't get to be the number one and say the Cosby Show. (laughs) Coach? Coach was not one of these. Full House. Full House is not on this list. (laughs) I realized this was on the list, and if I had realized it earlier, I would have guessed it earlier. I would like to take Cheers, please. Cheers was number three, which gets Molly eight points. Roseanne? Roseanne is the other number one. Ones I just noticed. Yeah! Erica takes the lead. I'm gonna say cops. Cops is not on the list. Ramin gets his third error. Ah. Out. Ramin, you're bad at TV. My faith in America is low because I there's a lot of other things on here that I like more, but I think America has shitty taste. America, this is you. I'm gonna say the Wonder Years. The Wonder Years is. Number eight, Molly gets three points. Unsolved Mysteries. Unsolved Mysteries is not on the list. Erica has her second error. I think it's Family Matters. Family Matters is not on the list. Molly Ah. has her second error. Damn, I kind of want to watch our last video again. Arsenio Hall. No, Erica is out. 
I just realized that Seinfeld is still on the list. I would like to guess Seinfeld. I might regret this because I think maybe he didn't get popular until well into the run, but let's just go for it. Yes, he did not get popular until well into the run. I lose. So the others, number six was... It's Monday Night Football. I'm going to just die. Me too. Come on, the Golden Girls. Um, oh, I almost guessed the Golden Girls. Number nine, Empty Nest, which is that one that Erica is the only one he knows existed. And I'm sorry, Molly. It's Monday Night Football. That was number 10. No! It would have gotten you one point. Since we are separating these episodes into different categories, we are not going to carry these over, these points over. So that means Erica wins this round. Woo-hoo! Molly comes in second place and Ramin comes in third place. Any trends we want to talk about with this? It seems to me pretty same all compared to 85 on basically when it comes to TV. Most of the top shows are shows that have been top shows for at least a year. Well, and you know what I think is interesting? Like when we were playing the game, Ramin is like trying to undercut like American taste, which I totally get the sentiment for that. But I think if you look at the shows, like they are actually good shows, right? The ones that are actually on the top rated for the most part, like they're actually good, well-written, well-acted, funny shows. And so um, I think that Americans, they go for quality. Roseanne. Roseanne was a cutting edge show. You forget the conversation that we had about it. Roseanne was showing a grittier side of lower middle class life that a lot of people identified with. I think you're coloring it with the recent controversies of the last four or five years surrounding her. I never liked Roseanne. But you're never. You, you're not all of America. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, I'm not. <laughs> you're not yet. Maybe someday you'll be all. You're of not America. every woman, Ramin. <laughs> It's not all in me. (laughs) If we look at the top, at least the co-number ones, they are showing a part of America that is not on TV prior to this, at least not that much. When we get down to like shows that are actually pretty progressive, like The Golden Girls is actually quite progressive. It's surprising that in 1989, it still had this kind of staying power. To, at least surprising to me, who was cynical about everything. A Different World was also a very progressive show. And 60 Minutes was just really good investigative journalism. The outlier on this list to me is America's Funniest Home Videos, which was dudes getting whacked in the nuts. And Mon- Monday Night for Entertainment. <laughs> and Monday Night Football, which was also dudes getting well, whacked in the nuts. It's sports. <laughs> you know, people like sports. That's that's fine. That's people getting hit in the head, Erica, and having concussions and, and permanent brain damage. And also, none of us really know what Empty Nest is. Erica's the only one who's ever seen it. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. I mean, Cheers was ubiquitous. Yeah. The Cosby Show was everywhere. Everybody did a great job. You're all pretty, but especially me. And uh, good job, the 80s. You did it again. (laughs) Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, Please let us know if we missed anything that you really liked. If there are any points that you feel should be made that we didn't make. Please give us a like, a follow, tell your Sunday school teacher about us. Um, Have them pray for us. We need it. Go do something good. I like that. Go do something good. Maintain your groovy selves.